It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? You know, um, at the beginning of the year, end of last year, beginning of the year, we, we, we decided, and it really wasn't us, we prayed and we asked the Lord, we said, God, what is your word over the year? Does anybody else do that? Where you say, hey, God, what are you speaking over this new year of my life? And we felt that God was saying to us that this was a year of inhabitation. Everybody say inhabitation. I love that word inhabitation. Not just a year of habitation, but a year of inhabitation. It implies action. It implies personal responsibility. It implies movement. It implies that we take the Lord at his word and we go after his promises in our lives. That we inhabit promised lands. That we step into prophetic words. That we move closer into what God has called us to do. And so we have been declaring over 2021 that this is a year of inhabitation. And I couldn't help but to recognize something that Pastor Michael Miller said last Sunday. I don't know if you guys caught it, but it was right in his introduction. He said, I feel like you guys are crossing over. Did anybody else hear that? And I'm like, inhabitation, right? Because that, that's essentially what was happening in the book of Joshua as the people of God, Israel, were about to inhabit the promised land. They had to cross over. And I thought, you know what? I should dive into the word this week and I should study the crossover. I should study the crossover. What does it mean to cross over? What does it look like to cross over well? And God, how might we as a community, as a family, and as individuals cross over and inhabit and go into those promised places? And so I've been praying about that this week, that word that Pastor Michael uh, spoke. It's, it's just stuck with me. And as I thought about crossing over and as I thought about inhabiting, you know what I recognize? Inhabiting is hard. You know what else I realized? Inhabiting is expensive. I know y'all wouldn't believe that, but man, just the little things as they pile up. Anybody in here ever did a home renovation before? It's like you think everything's done and then they hit you right at the end. They're like, actually, there's an additional 20%. And you're like, what? It's kind, you know, it's kind of been the same here as we've been preparing this place for Jesus. It's been a little expensive, but you know what? It's also hard. It's hard to inhabit, man. I, I was reading through the book of Joshua, and uh, I was reminded of Joshua chapter 1, verse 3. You remember that uh, scripture when, when God spoke to Joshua, and he said, Anywhere you put your foot, I've given it to you. You guys remember that? He said, If you put your foot there, it's your inheritance, right? Inhabit your inheritance. If you put your foot there, it's yours. And uh, I thought, man, that's really cool. And then I read the next 13 chapters, and guess what? Joshua had to defeat 31 kings. He got the prophetic word. How many of you guys got a prophetic word from the Lord, right? You're like, yes, sir. I got my promises. I'm going to shout about them. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm so happy about the inhabitation that's going to happen for me in 2021. And then you start moving toward your promises. You start moving toward, could I say, your destiny. And then you start to realize there are some kings that are standing in your territory, and they're saying, I ain't going to let this place go without a fight, man. I don't know what you're thinking. You think you're just going to waltz in here and take territory for the kingdom of Jesus? You guys hear what I'm saying this morning? It's like, no, no, we expect resistance, but the prophetic word, the promises that have been spoken over us, they come attached with grace to confront anything that confronts us as we inhabit into places of our inheritance. And I was thinking about that this week. I'm like, man, inhabitation is hard. You know, principalities and powers, they don't want to give up territory. The enemy, he doesn't want to let go of people who are in his grip. He doesn't want to do that, you know. But we have these words. And so how do we inhabit well? That's what I was asking myself this week. And so I started reading through that book of Joshua, and I have, some, I have some scripture here for you guys. Joshua chapter 3, if you want to open your Bible. Joshua chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 6 this morning. And then I've got, okay, it's kind of a lot of points. Will you guys stay with me for eight points? All right, I, I, you, you guys ain't got nowhere else to be anyway. You know, it's icy out. You guys ain't got nowhere else to be either watching online. So I got eight points. I'm going to move through them quick. But I've got eight, I, I would say, 
maybe revelations, extractions, if you will, from Joshua chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. And I may just turn this thing into a sermon series and preach from Joshua chapter 3 over the next two, three weeks. And we might just brand this thing the crossover. I don't know. Let's go after it, okay? So if you're at Joshua chapter 3, verse 1, say, I'm there. Come on, I can't hear you from the living room at home. Say, I'm there. Let's go drop it in the chat. Say, I'm there. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shatim. Now, I know you wanted to pronounce that differently, and that's why I put it in there for you. Shatim, all right? And they came to the Jordan. I helped you out there. That's a little pastoral help. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over. Now, I want you to notice right here what was happening. They were preparing to step into their promised land, but right before they crossed over, they decided it might be a good thing to pause for the cause and to prepare for the inhabitation, right? So that's what they're doing. They're stopping there for a minute. And at the end of the three days, the officers, everybody say the leaders, the officers went through the camp and they began to command the people, as soon as you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, everybody say the presence of God. Come on, y'all help me preach this this morning. The covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place and you shall follow it. Woo, that's, that's going to preach good here in a minute. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go. That's, that's key right there. Do not go near it in order that you may know the way you should go. For you have not passed this way before. Man, look at your neighbor right now. Say, I'm going to places I've never been. Come on, tap them right now out on the couch. That's it. Slap your husband high five. Something. Do it, you know. Let's go. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Man, this is a good passage, isn't it, Brian? It's a good passage. Tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priest, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and they went before the people. So the title of my message today is this, to get there, follow the Ark. All right? To get there, follow the Ark. Lord, we, we've already prayed a lot, but we pray and we bless your word and we thank you, God, that you're going to minister to us through it today. It's everlasting and we're grateful for it. It never fades away and it always accomplishes its intent. We thank you for that. We say amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Awesome. So the title of the message, to get there, follow the ark. And whenever I say there, what am I talking about? I, I want to clarify that. When I say there, I'm talking about your promised lands. I'm talking about the promises that you have from Jesus. I'm talking about the vision that God has given you. I'm talking about the business God's called you to start. I'm talking about the ministry that God's called you to birth. I'm talking about the songs that God says you're going to write. I'm talking about the messages that you're going to preach. Let's go, Ben. You know, I'm talking about those dreams, not just good dreams. I'm talking about God dreams. The things that God has breathed into you. Whenever I say there, that's what I mean. Wherever and whatever land that you have been called to inhabit in 2021. I think it's very interesting that in, in, this, in this passage historically, uh, the people of God were eating something called manna. You guys remember that? They were eating manna. Well, in this, um, in this moment, the manna had dried up. It was very interesting, right? So their manna had dried up. So we know they were waiting there for three days. Perhaps they anticipated uh, that manna would return. Maybe they did. I don't know. Maybe they thought God had simply called them to a fast. You know, maybe they got to the border of their promised land 
And then all of a sudden there was no manna that day. So they're hanging out waiting. They're thinking like, okay, is God calling us to fast? What are we supposed to do? Maybe we'll just hang out right here. But then they recognized something, and that was this, that God wasn't feeding them the same way that he had fed them over the last some decades, but he was changing up their diet, and he was saying, in order to get your next meal, you're going to have to inhabit those places that I've called you to. Some of us have been dissatisfied by what we've been feeding from because we've stayed a bit too long in the wilderness. The Lord is actually saying, inhabit your promised lands, and it's not me that's simply going to give you the land, but it's you that I've empowered by my spirit to step into those places and to displace the enemy and take hold of your territories. So if you want to eat, move. If you want to eat, move. If you want to get what God has for you, move. We can't always expect that God's just going to hand feed us forever. We can't stay in the state of babes when God has empowered us by his grace to move into places that the enemy is currently occupying that he said, no, 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 I want that place. I believe that's why God sent us to 901 Delbrook. I really do, you guys. I believe that the enemy, in some sense of the word, was very satisfied with this church being decrepit. But now that we've inhabited... <laughs> but now that we are here, right, I believe God has big plans to influence this community, to impact this neighborhood, and to bring about revival for his people that belong to him who are here. I believe that. And so we're moving forward. We had done as much as we could do in 900 Gallatin. We had eaten all we could eat at 900 Gallatin. We had feasted on the manna that he was giving us, but he said, you know what, it's time to grow up. You're going to have to stop waiting on the manna to show up every morning. You're going to have to start planting some crops. You're going to have to start working. You're going to have to start tilling the soil. You're going to have to go out and water them. You're going to have to put the fertilizer down. And when the crops come up, you're going to have to harvest them. You're going to have to bust your butt a little bit and bring it into the barn. Are you guys getting the parable here? Listen, next week we are going to 9 and 11. All right, we're, we're doing two services, partly because of the parking, okay? So it's a little pastoral tidbit that I'm throwing in. All right, listen, we want more of you guys to take on the responsibility of gathering up the harvest. We're not at 900 anymore. It was a smaller house, and God did so much. I mean, literally, that church was given to us. A $2 million piece of property was given to us, quick claim deed. We didn't even pay the taxes. Like that church gave us that building just like God gave the Israelites manna. But this is a different season, church. Listen, I wish the place was full this morning so I could preach this like, oh, like, just get after it. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. But we are moving into a new season, and it is a season where we cannot just sit on our hands and expect God to hand feed us anymore. But we have to rise up. We have to take part in the harvest by taking personal responsibility to inhabit the places that God's called us to. And that's going to mean some of us who haven't served before, you're going to have to join the parking team. I don't know if you noticed, but it's kind of, it's like somebody literally left the conference the other night, and they said, I bet cars were going for half a mile. And I was like, really? We need more people on the parking team. And for those of you uh, guys in here that are interested in that, guess what? We're about to buy a golf cart. We're going to give you some walkie-talkies. I don't even know what it is about men and walkie-talkies. You know what I'm saying, dog? It's like when you get a walkie-talkie, you just become, you are empowered. You put that thing over your ear, you're like, yeah, I got it. Don't you? you walk bigger. I got them. I'm going to pick them up. Right? We got that for you guys. We're going to need more of you guys to serve as, as, as welcome team and greeters, people who are coming into our house. We're going to need more people to serve in Legacy Kids. Give me two good amens. Yeah. We're going to need more people to serve all over the house because God has called us into a different season and he is not feeding us in the same way. Amen. I didn't mean for that to be that long because that's just the introduction, but I think it's important, you know, for me to just, you know, try to pass you a little bit and encourage you to do that. Uh, but they prepared for these few days before they set out to inhabit. And before they, uh, before they were to move, uh, God told Joshua something. He said, as soon as you see the ark. And this is how the, the I'm, I'm going to say the church, because it is a picture of the church being an Old Testament type, being Israel. But th before the church moves, God says, make sure that you see the ark. 
you are supposed to look to the ark. Now, for context, what is the ark, okay? I know we've seen it like in Indiana Jones. If you grew up watching the Indiana Jones series, you know the ark was buried in that cave over in the Middle East. But the ark was not actually a really big box. It was a smaller box. It was made out of acacia wood. There had gold over it. And listen, guys, the ark was not magical. Okay, you have to know, the ark was not magical. The ark was holy. All right? Why was it holy? Here's one of the reasons why it was holy. It's because he had the word of God in it. Right? Literally, the, that's why they call it the Ark of the Testimony. Is because Moses received the Ten Commandments, right? And they were inscribed by God in stone, and they were placed in the Ark, the Ark of the Testimony. It held the Word of God, therefore it was holy. The Ark was, was, was so holy, in fact, uh, that there was a time in which someone touched it, uh, and, and they were struck dead immediately. Uh, because, and, and, and this is my, my theory. I, I don't want to go into a long theological discourse on that, but my theory real quick is because it was, it was handled irre, ir, irreverently. And that's how God feels about his presence. We don't come into the presence of God flippantly. We, we don't just treat the presence of God like it's, uh, you know, any old thing. Right? It's a holy thing. And so we come in with a healthy respect. We, we come in with an awe. We come in with a wonder. We come in with a reverence. We come in with the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord in the Old Testament might be defined as this. I don't want to get too close to him. Right? But the fear of the Lord in the New Testament is defined like this. I don't want to be far away from him. I have to be where God is. And the, the ark was holy because it was the symbol of God's presence. Everybody say God's presence. It was the symbol of God's presence. And so what happened was whenever the tabernacle was built and, and, and the uh, Israelites built that and the instructions were given to Moses, they took that ark and they placed it behind a really heavy curtain. And, and they put it in the inner part of the tabernacle, and it was called the Holies of Holies because that is where the unfiltered glory of God would dwell, sitting upon the ark. And so it was so holy, and it required so much reverence that before a priest could even go into that uh, place to minister unto the Lord, they had to bathe, they had to get clean. They even tied bells around their ankles, right, in case they went in there and were struck dead so that they could pull them out by a rope that was tied around their waist. Isn't it, isn't it incredible to, to think about how the Israelites so revered the presence of God and how, you know, uh, how, how, how sometimes we as believers will respond to the presence of God today? Like, we, we need to have a return of that healthy respect of the presence of God. God is holy. God is powerful. God is awesome. And, and this is what the Israelites understood, and that's what the ark represented. It, it, it represented the glory of God. It represented the tangible presence of God. It represented the word of God. It represented the holiness of God. And so when you saw the ark, you were like, man, the, the Lord is here. Right? So the ark represents the presence of God. And I, don't, I know sometimes, I, I mean, I grew up Pentecostal, so I, I always heard presence of God, presence of God, presence of God. And, and, you know, I know for some people, they're like, what does that mean? That's kind of mystical, the presence of God. And when I say the presence of God, just super simple definition, I'm just talking about where God is. Where God is moving, where God is speaking, where God is felt, where God is known, where God is encountered. And that is who we are here at Legacy. We are a presence people. And so in real time, we value the presence of the ark. You guys get what I'm saying? We value the presence of Jesus. We value the presence of the word. And so before the people of God were going to inhabit, God spoke to Joshua and he said, I don't want you to move until you see the ark move. This is important. I don't want you to move until you see the ark move because the ark is representative of the presence of God. And so everybody was instructed to look for the presence. I wish, I, I, I pray, that's a better way of saying that. I pray that we would come to church with the same expectation. That we would come to church with the expectation to look for the presence of God. And that's actually point one from this. Is to get there, to inhabit, to get to your promised land, to get there, expectantly look for the presence of God. I want you to expect to encounter God. I want you to expect to see uh, the goodness of Jesus. And this is very important that we pay attention to when and to where 
God is moving. And uh, I, I also want to ask you to, to consider how is it that you know God is moving? You know, how, how is it for you? I cry. You know, that's what I do. I just know I, I'm a baby when it comes to uh, the presence of Jesus. You know, I, I just believe that it's always brokenness unto breakthrough in the kingdom of God. And so here's what I use. Some, some people feel peace, you know, and that's, that's great. I, everybody's different, and, and none is greater than the other. You don't have to cry to acknowledge the presence of God. You know, some people just feel peace, you know. I, I don't know. I might think that's how Brian experiences the presence of God. He's a very peaceful man, you know. And, uh, and, so, and that's great. But how do you experience the presence of God? Move towards that. When, when, when you start receiving something or a, a dream or a vision or you're, you're praying about something, notice when is it that the presence of God moves upon you? How is God moving? And be drawn into that. Expectantly look for the presence of God. I use brokenness as a compass in my life. When something moves me to tears, I know. It's like I need to pay attention. You know, I need to pay attention. And uh, I got to tell you guys, I hope you're encouraged by this. Nothing brings me to tears quicker than God's house right now in this season. This church, what God's doing here, I just, I, I just break down. I'm telling you, I'll tell you a funny story. So on Friday night, I was so nervous, you guys, to preach in our own church. Because I was just like, this is so new and crazy. And after I preached, I, th I guess because I was so anxious prior, but God really moved. If you were here on Friday night, God's totally moved. And I just went over there and I hid behind that half wall and I just started crying. And then the man of peace, Brian, the bearded man of peace, came up and he didn't even say anything. He just rubbed my back. <laughs> that was a good moment though, wasn't it? It was a good moment. The bearded man of peace. All right, here's the next part I want you to notice in the Bible here. It says, being carried by the Levitical priest. Listen, I may not always see or sense the presence of God for myself, but know this, people carry presence. There are people that carry presence. And so what I want to encourage you to do is I want you to look for these people. I want you to look for people in your life that carry the presence of God. I want you to be on the lookout. Uh, it's worth paying attention to leaders, pastors, preachers, prophets, ministers, intercessors, prayer warriors, churches. You know, where is God moving? You know, I'm looking for people who are carrying the presence. And when someone is carrying presence, church, they're not simply carrying power. All right? Presence is more than that because presence is marked by holiness. All right? We're talking about the holy of holies, right? The ark of the covenant is holy. The presence of God is holy. And so we're not only looking for power from, from leaders, but we're also looking for holiness. And I believe that these are the only priests that we as a church collect, collectively should look to follow. Not just people who are powerful, but people who are walking in holiness, people who are carrying the presence. And you know that somebody's carrying the presence when it's not all about them. You know what I'm saying? When you don't get around them and sense how awesome they are. You get around them and you sense how awesome God is. You're like, wow. This person is obviously carrying presence because every time I look to them, they redirect my focus to him. This person is carrying presence. These are the priests that are worth following. It's all about him. Be on the lookout for these kinds of priests. And good news, because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, we're all priests now. We all can carry the glory of God now. We can all be presence carriers now because that's what Jesus has done for us through his blood. All right. So number two, this is number two. To get there, look for leadership from people who carry the presence of God. All right. Look for leadership from people that you can identify and say, man, these people, these people are walking in the sauce. That's what I say. They're walking in the sauce, man. They are just, they are filled up. Every time you get around them, they're sharing with you more revelation that they receive from the word of God. Every time you get around them, it seems like they're bubbling up with a prophetic word. You can't even get through a dinner and they're like, you know what I feel like God's saying to you? You know what I'm talking about? And it's just, there's just something about those people where you can identify, man, these people are carrying the presence. They're priests. And those type of people are worth following. Moving on, you look, you look through uh, what, what God is speaking to Joshua. He says this, I want you then to set out from your place and begin to follow the ark. And this is the only time that we move as presence people. 
We move when God moves us. When we see God moving, we move. When we see our leaders moving, following the presence of God, we follow them in and we move as well. We don't look for just good things. You know, it's not just about good things, but it's about God things. You know, it's not, it's not just, oh, that seems like a good idea, right? No, is that a God idea? Listen, I, I'll tell you, one of, the, uh, one of the hardest things, I think, is not navigating failure, but navigating success. I'm serious, because like whenever you're, when, when you're going through something really, really hard, or you go through a season, your options are limited. But when there's breakthrough happening around you and God puts favor on your life, all of a sudden you got all these options. You guys know what I'm talking about. All of you, I mean, I know most of you guys in this room, that's how it is. Some of you guys right now are experiencing so much favor. And so you're not praying for open doors anymore. You're praying, Lord, show me the right doors. <laughs> because I have so many opportunities, I don't want to just choose a good thing because it helps me feel more comfortable. I want to choose a God thing because it leads me deeper into your presence. And I can experience more of you as I go on this journey of obedience. And I'm not just looking for success from the world's eyes. I'm looking for faithfulness from God's eyes. Because no matter what I get from anybody else, I'm not in this thing for what I can get from them but what I can receive from him by being in his presence. You guys know what I'm talking about. And so when you find yourself at a fork in the road, I think you have to consider for a little bit, which is the direction that God is leading me, not just the direction that feels good to myself, but which is the direction that I get more of him. Which is the direction that I have more experiences with Jesus? Which is the direction that I know that I'll be able to do everything he's called me to do by spending time with him in his presence? Follow the presence. Follow the presence. Let me tell you, don't be overly attached to anything as much as you are the presence of God. Don't be overly attached to a position. Like a, like a role or a title. Don't be overly attached to a place. Like a building. Can I just say that? Like, you know, I know it was awesome at our old space. It was amazing. There were a lot less problems. It was so small. You know, I asked Spencer, you know, Spencer's the facility. He oversees the facilities here. And he's like scratching his head. He's like, this is a lot more cleaning. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean? It's, it is. It's, it's harder. It's harder. So don't get too attached to any particular position. Just get attached to the presence. And let the presence lead you. Not a place, not a position, but presence. And then God says, yet there shall be a distance between you and it. Talking about the ark. Yes, the ark was holy. Yes, the ark required respect. But it wasn't just that that God said, I want you to maintain a healthy distance. It wasn't just because, of the, 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 um, but the, because the ark was dangerous. It wasn't just that. Here, here's what it was about the most. It was about the ark being first. That's what it was about. The reason why God said, I want you to stay behind the ark was not because the ark was so dangerous, but because it was the priority. It said, listen, whenever I lead you, I want to lead you by my presence. I want you to follow my presence. I want you to follow the ark. And so that's point number three, to get there, Give the presence of God leadership in your life. Become obsessed with making decisions in the presence. Become obsessed with making decisions in prayer and in devotion. And, and you know what? Some of the craziest ideas I get are in prayer. They really are. And it's always a temptation to doubt in the darkness what God spoke to you about in the light. Isn't it? Because that's, the enemy loves that. That's, what, that's why Jesus gave us the parable of the seed and the sower. Because we receive the word of God initially with gladness, right? But then as we walk it out, the enemy comes along and he plucks it up. And so one of the things I try to do is I, I try to journal because I want to remember and I want to commit to what God speaks to me about in the presence so that whenever I step out of that place and I'm no longer filled with so much confidence, I don't lose hope that it was actually God that spoke and I don't stop taking responsibility for what I know he's called me to do. I, I know that's a little better and some of you guys are saying amen. I know it's helping you this morning because I'm telling you, so often I have done that. Where I'm like, I I'll hear the Lord speak and then the next day I'll say, I don't think that was the Lord. 
You guys know what I'm talking about. And you start reasoning with your rational mind why that was not God because you know physically it'll make you uncomfortable. But listen, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And what God speaks to us in the spirit cannot be rationalized through our actual mind. The, the bread is spiritual. The word is spiritual. The promises are spiritual. The, the prophecies are, are spiritual. So they can't be rationalized. They, they can't be understood by the natural mind. They have to be received by the Spirit. Everything that you have in the kingdom of God is received by inheritance. <laughs> you have to understand this, and this helps us to stay more grateful, and it helps us to remain less arrogant. <laughs> because when we really recognize that the only great things in our lives has come from God, we recognize you received it rather than worked for it. You say, man, Jesus, you were so good by dying for me on the cross. It's because you paved a path that I get to walk out this goodness. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and so I want to encourage you, follow that presence. Man, when, you're, when you step out of the presence of God, when you step out of the presence of God and you're confronted by your natural mind, you have to remember this. The presence may have been, uh, you know, a singular experience, but you're still packing the power. You're still packing the power that you received in the presence. A lot of people get confused about presence and power. A lot of people get confused about glory and anointing. Can I talk about it for a second? All right, a lot of people get confused about that, right? And so they say, man, I feel the presence of God. But you don't really feel the presence of God. You know the presence of God. Right? What you feel is the power of God. So when God shows up and he starts moving and you're like, oh, I got the glory goosebumps. You guys know what I'm talking about? When I was a kid and I used to sit in the back of the church, I used to get the glory goosebumps and I'd just start drawing and pretend like I didn't feel it because I didn't want to respond to the altar call. And people still do that as adults. They're like, I feel something in here. I know God is in the room. What you feel is the power of God. What you feel is the power of God, right? And so when you step into the presence of God, you become saturated with the power of God. This is a picture of baptism. One of the best translations of the word baptizo in the Greek is actually a pickling. Now, I'm from Kentucky, so I get this well. How many of you guys grew up eating pickled vegetables? Anybody else in here? Okay, one person. All right. We're, and we're both from Kentucky. Okay, so... Okay, so more of you guys, right? And so really that's what happens. When you spend time in the presence of God, you get pickled. This is not going over very well, I can already tell. But this is what happens. The more time you spend in the sauce, all right, I'm just trying to make it relevant. The more time you spend in the sauce, the more power you carry, all right? Power is anointing. So if you want to operate in more spiritual power, let me tell you how to do it. Spend more time in the presence. Because the more time you spend in the presence, the more power that you will walk in. Anytime you see somebody operating in power, you have to know, man, they at one point in time have spent time in the presence. You, it's not that we always are, are right there in the glory of God. It's not that we're always right, you know, right there beholding, right there. Yes, it's true that God is with us, but it's not always that we're in that presence in that place of the glory, but we can always walk in that power. We can always operate in that power as God anoints us from spending time in that secret place. And so it's a little sidebar, but that's the importance of the leadership of the presence. It's the importance of the priority of the presence. And so um, Israel was instructed, you have to stay behind the presence. You have to stay behind the ark. You have to give the presence of God leadership in your life. And before you move at all, you need to think about what God's called you to do in that place. Place of the presence and let him reveal to you how to move, how to go, when to step out. And I think that's important. I tweeted this out yesterday. If you have to violate your peace to get it, it's not God. You guys know what I'm talking about. When you're at a fork in the road and you're thinking about, should I do this or should I do that? And you're afraid to ask Jesus, that's a red flag. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about, right? You're like, I would pray, but I'm afraid of what he's going to say. Bingo, you have your answer, okay? You need to pray. <laughs> oh, I'm afraid he's going to ask me to do something hard. Right? John said, this is the love of God, that we would obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Right? 
When you are only attached to religion, obeying God is very difficult. But when you are in love, it is very easy. I would do things for my wife that I won't do for you. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm in love with her. And it's like, it ain't even a task. It's not even hard. Like, I'm happy to do it. Why? Because I'm in love with her. And other people look at us whenever we behave like that. And they're like, look at those religious fanatics. You're like, I'm not religious. I'm in love. I love the presence. I'm spending time in the presence. I'm infatuated with the presence of God. I'm so sorry. I can't get over him. <laughs> You're going to have to deal with it, you know. And so if you have to violate your peace to get it, it's not God. Go into the presence. Let him settle that in your spirit. Let him saturate you with peace, knowing this is what I'm called to do. This is what God has asked me to do. And uh, the next, next portion of the scripture says, in order that you may know the way you shall go, which brings up a very important point, church. Aside from the presence, you do not know where you're supposed to go. Now it's, okay, I understand it's a little challenging, all right? Outside of the presence, we do not know how we are supposed to move. Without the presence of God, church, we are lost. We're left to our own devices. We're trying to figure it out on our own. But God wants to be your guidepost. And if we will spend time in the presence of God, he is faithful to reveal to us the path we're called to walk out. I promise you. And you don't have to go through life confused about should I do this or should I do that. You just have to go to the presence. You don't have to walk through your life saying, should I take this job or should I take that job? Should I move here or should I move there? Should I go there or should I, should I go back? You know, but in the presence, God makes it plain. He says, listen, follow the presence. I know we are so attached to the idea of destiny. And it is, I, I get it, it's important. Destiny, I think, is real. Uh, God calls us into great things. But listen, your destiny is not a place. Your destiny is not a position. Your destiny is not an income bracket. Your destiny is not a follower count. Your destiny is a person. His name is Jesus. If you will follow Jesus, it will guarantee that you end up where you're supposed to be. You say, look, I'm going to stay connected with Jesus. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to follow him, submit to him, obey to him, and he's going to guarantee that I end up where I'm supposed to be. He is going to guarantee that I am transformed into the person I'm called to become. He is going to guarantee that I end up in the location that I am supposed to end up in, taking the job that I am supposed to have, making the money that I am supposed to make, because he is going to speak to you even about the little stuff about how to be faithful and about how to be a good steward and about how to bring his presence into those places because he wants to go with you. That's called co-laboring. Your destiny is a person and his name is Jesus. If you will attach yourself to Jesus, here's what I can promise you. You will go to places you never thought you could go. You will meet people you never thought you would meet. You will do things you never thought you could do. And the entire time you'll receive consistent confirmations that you are doing what God has asked you to do because you are in his presence. I'm telling you the truth. In order that you will know the way that you shall go. Listen, if you follow God's presence, you're always moving in the right direction. If you will follow God's presence, you will always move in the right direction. All right, point four. So that, that, that is point four. To not get lost, make the presence of God your number one priority. To not get lost, just say, this is, this is, I'm devoted. I'm a presence person. This is it for me. I am submitted. I am called to the person of Jesus. So when you commit to the presence, church, you commit to the right path for your life. And I love this. We shouted about it when we read it. So the Bible says, you have not passed by this way before. And if you'll follow God, you'll go to new places. I can promise you that. Do you know how often I sit with people at coffee and they tell me they're bored? I'm being serious. Like as a pastor, I'm very caffeinated. And we, we drink a lot of coffee. I, I've cut down some of my coffee appointments now because I just can't keep up. You know, and our staff has grown a little bit, and so I'm doing a lot of coffee with them, you know. And, uh, but you know how often I'll sit with young people especially, and they'll say, I'm just so bored. I'll say, you're not bored, you're just disobedient. Because here's the thing, if you will connect to God in his presence, he will have you doing stuff that is crazy. <laughs> you guys don't believe me, do you? Because the Lord will be like, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go there. I want you to do this. I want you to say that. I want you to talk to that person. And, you, you know, even little stuff, like you're standing in the grocery store, and all of a sudden you feel an unction. I need to go tell that person that God loves them. 
That is risky business. They might cuss you out. You don't know. They may spit on you, smack you in the face. Your adrenaline is going to get going. But here's what I can promise you. On the other side of your obedience is your adventure. If you want your life to get real festive really quick, surrender to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> because you're going to be hearing this about once a month. You hadn't passed by this way before. Wow, you have followed the presence into a dangerous place. And I can't promise you your safety, but I will promise you my faithfulness. Right? You guys remember that? You, the, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, right? Narnia, right? Aslan, right? So what's Aslan like? Well, he's, he's not safe, but he's good. I know everybody would like to believe that if you'll follow presence, you're just going to live, you're just going to fall gracefully into a Thomas Kincaid painting. But that's just not going to happen on certain days. Listen, on certain days, following God's presence is going to look like a lion's den. That's the truth. Following God's presence is going to look like rebuking a Pharaoh and saying, let my people grow. Following God's presence is going to be like, hey, load up the ark, man. Water's about to flood the earth. Some days it's going to look like Paul getting shipwrecked. Some days it's going to look like Jesus sweating drops of blood in Gethsemane. Some days it's going to look like being pinned up to a bloody cross while people insult you, ridicule you, throw stuff at you, make fun at you. But you know what you will have in that moment? Presence. You will have the faithfulness of Jesus. You will have the word of Jesus. You will have the holiness of God. You will have him with you. And listen, Jesus identified with us in all ways, right? That's what it says. He's our high priest who empathizes with us in our weaknesses. That's why he quoted David from Psalm 22 on the cross. He said, my God, my God, how, what, you've forsaken me. Jesus wasn't forsaken, but he felt forsaken. Now, how often do we feel forsaken when we're following him? Jesus has empathized with you in that weakness. And here's what he promises. He is with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Even to the end of the age, you will have presence. <laughs> Forgive me while I, you know, get excited because I know God's presence being with me always makes me the majority. It doesn't matter if I enter into a room full of evil people who are following the enemy. It doesn't matter if I enter into a country that's completely dark and shut down and doesn't want the gospel. If I walk in following the presence of God, I walk in with the majority. I walk in with the, with the superior uh, spirit, I walk in with the kingdom, I walk in with the light, I walk in with love, I walk in with power. You guys with me this morning? Listen, you may not always feel prepared, but you can always be dependent. I'm going to say it again because it's good. You may not always feel prepared, but you can always be dependent. And I'm telling you right now, God is not looking at the most prepared person in the room, but he is looking for people who are dependent. People said, man, I should, I'm not even qualified to do this. I'm not even qualified to lead this church. You guys laugh because I've been doing it for a while, but that's the truth. You guys know my testimony. You know where I came from. It's, it's bad. I was a drug addict, man. I was living out of my own car, selling crack. That's what I was doing, you know. And look what God has done. And it's not about being prepared. It's about being dependent. It's about saying, you know, I want to get the education. Yes, I want to read. I want to study. I want to receive. I want people to teach me and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I am so dependent upon the presence of God that it doesn't matter what happens. I've already chosen. I'm with you. I'm with you. I ain't going nowhere unless you move. I ain't saying nothing unless you speak. I ain't moving until you move. I am following the ark. I am consecrated. I am dedicated. I am fully devoted to the presence. And nobody's going to move me off this trajectory. Nobody. Not sickness. Not death. Not hell. Not attack. Not insults. It doesn't matter what you take away from me. I know what I already have. And his name is Jesus. I have the presence. This is the way I'm going. And we do it the whole time. We pray the whole time. Listen, taking territory without prayer is how you get evicted. Because where the Lord wants to take you is into places where there's giants, man. You think David could have took out Goliath without the presence? The slingshot wasn't enough, man. He wasn't prepared enough. Yeah, he had killed the lion, the tiger, the bear, oh my, everything, you know. But it wasn't enough. He understood it's not my slingshot that's going to save me. <laughs> it's not my works 
that's going to save me. It's the, the fact that I'm going to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit. I am dependent upon the presence of God. I am following the ark. And today, the ark has led me to a battlefield where I'm to confront Goliath. This is why people stop following presence. It's because presence takes you to places you've never been before. Listen, you think presence is just for like the intercessor types. You think presence is just for the people uh, that just like to go to conferences. You think presence is just like for people who just like to listen to worship. No, no, presence is for warriors, man. Presence is for God's gangsters. Presence is for people who say, listen, this is all there is for me. It's going to take me into some dangerous places, but I won't stop because I know I've seen too much. It's, it's presence and presence only for me. Am I too excited to preach to 15 people this morning? <laughs> I'm a presence person. Hallelujah. That's all there is for us, Lord. We, we, we say that out loud. That's all. Listen, Israel lost every battle they didn't pray through. Read it. Read it. Anytime David went into the tent, he said, Lord, should I go against these people? And the Lord's like, nope. He said, okay, I ain't doing it. But what happened when he did anyway? They lost. But what happened when he went to the tent? He said, Lord, do I need to go up against them? Because we're really outnumbered. The Lord said, go up against them. <laughs> we're going. What happened? Victory. Every time, look at Gideon. Gideon had 300 people. They literally had shofars and clay pots with candles in them. <laughs> they were outnumbered 300 over 20,000 warriors. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry, I came to preach today. I, my bad, the ice ain't going to ice me out. I just, I'm on fire. Let's go. Okay, point five. I got to get through this, don't I? I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time this morning. I know you guys are watching from the living room, but we in here having church this morning. <laughs> it's hot in here. We're next to the fireplace. Let's go. <laughs> Icy outside, but hot in here. Let's go. Point five. To get there and stay there, become completely dependent upon the presence of God. Nobody can move you so long as you're dependent. No, no, no devil in hell. There's no plan from the enemy that can move you so long as you stay dependent. Here's the next part of the scripture. It says, consecrate yourselves. And, and now this is, consecration is like a cuss word today. Isn't it? People don't like that. They're like, consecrate. Oh, oh, oh. I'm here for the power. But I don't know about the holiness. Can I, can I get the power without the holiness? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, the gifts of God are given without repentance. But the gifts that God wants to give you is so much bigger than the gifts you think you can even handle. And the only way we receive those is from the presence, all right? And so Joshua says, if you're going to follow the presence of God and you're going to inhabit the places that God has called you to inhabit, you're going to have to consecrate yourself. Now, what is consecration? Number one, consecration is preparation, all right? We have to prepare. And there is no better way to prepare for inhabitation by spending time in God's presence. By spending time in God's prayer, having that peace, ha having that brokenness like we talked about, having that strength, having that focus, that clarity, that power. And you say, man, when I step out of this place, I step out of this place with a word from God. And here's what my dad always reminds me of. He says, without a word, you're full of fear. But with a word, you're fearless. The presence of a word kicks fear in the face. Isn't it crazy how as soon as you hear a word from the Lord, it's just all the fear just goes away. And, and you know, on Friday night, you know, we opened up here and it was an amazing time, such, such an awesome time. And, uh, and I was standing right over here where you guys are and, and my dad was sitting right there and, and I went over and my dad, he just hugged me, he just cried. <laughs> yeah, I posted the picture on Instagram. He's Christ, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Good job, son. Way to go. Way to go. And, uh, and, then, and then we stood next to each other. And my dad, he gets very sentimental about things at times. And Spencer, my brother's here, he could tell you. And my dad said, he looked at me. And my dad's aggressive, man. He's a warrior, all right? He runs marathons in his spare time. And so he looked over at me. He said, don't you ever forget this. <laughs> I'm serious. He goes, if I die tonight, don't you ever forget this. 
And I said, okay, all right, Dad, bring it. And you know what, you know what he said? Don't ever stop fasting. <laughs> Consecration. Right? That's what he said. He said, don't ever stop fasting. Don't ever stop consecrating. Don't ever stop. He said most people won't do it because most people won't hurt. But we will. Isn't that good? Consecrate yourself because, listen, you've got territory to take. And there's 31 kings sitting on your throne. Right? There's principalities. There's powers. There's, there, there, there's demons. This is all from Paul, right? He says it right there in Ephesians, right? Everything that tries to impede the progress of the kingdom of Jesus, they're all standing in the way. Who's sitting on your throne? Right? And, and the Lord's saying, that place belongs to you. That, 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 that sphere of culture belongs to you. That drug den belongs to you. That brothel belongs to you. That church belongs to you. That street corner belongs to you. That shopping mall belongs to you. I want you to advance the kingdom of Jesus in that place. Listen, the, the Pharaohs don't like to be told what to do. But you say, no, I'm going to consecrate myself. I'm going to prepare myself. I'm going to get pickled in the power. I'm going to get so full of God that when I step out of his presence, I know that what I'm carrying is holy. And, and, and you saw what happened to Uzzah when he touched what was holy. He got struck dead. <laughs> listen, there are times, man, like when, listen, and if you're watching today, I bless you. But listen, there were people cussing us out this week in the DMs like you would never believe. Like, that's why we, that's why we took some of the, the photos down because we were like, man, we don't want people to, you know, we don't, we, don't, we don't want people to be unkind to us, right? But I pray for those people because the Bible says you shouldn't touch the Lord's anointed. So I pray for them, man. I'm serious. I'm like, Lord, protect them. Lord, bless them. I cover them. You, Uzzah tried to, I, I mean, I'm not pronouncing death on anybody. You guys get what I'm saying, right? I'm not trying to be mean, all right? But you just got to be careful handling God's people. You got to be ha careful handling God's presence. You got to be careful handling whenever somebody steps in with a word, when somebody steps in with a promise. You got to be careful how you handle them. And I promise you this, when you step in, you can step in that fearless. Even the people who try to touch you, who come against you, are going to get touched by God. They may not realize it in the moment, but a seed has been sown into their spirit. And even if they think they're doing something against you, I promise you God is doing something for them. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. He dies. What does the centurion say? Surely this was the Son of God. We have to recognize that even in our persecution, we are evangelizing. I, I got to save this word for one of those fiery mission schools or something. Nah, we love it. I'm going to preach it next week. Come back again. Just kidding. Consecrate yourself. How do you consecrate? Fast. Pray. Repent. Obey. All right, point six. We're moving through that. I got, I got just three more. These are shorter ones, okay? So to get there and to go further, keep clean hands and a pure heart by being consistently washed in the presence of God. Get, listen, you know... It's hard to find somebody who has a lot of encounters who is arrogant. You know why? Because when I'm in the presence of Jesus, you know what I realize? How small I am. When I'm in the presence of Jesus, you know what I realize? How sinful I am. You know, when a Christian becomes arrogant, it's revealing that it's been a while since their last encounter. For, for, to, to have a big ego, I would have to deprive my soul of the presence. Because when I spend time in the presence, I get humbled. And I, I, I start to ask the Lord, purify my motives, purify my heart, purify my mind, purify my thoughts, cleanse me, clean me up, clean me up, God. I repent. This is what we do through consecration. And then God, of course, says, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And I mentioned this earlier, but presence today means power tomorrow. And so when I go into the presence, I'm coming out of that place with power. I'm coming out equipped. I'm coming out with the grace to do what God's called me to do. And presence is how you get anointed. If you've been wondering, God, how do I get anointed? Do I need impartation? Impartation's great. How do I get anointed? Is it another podcast? Podcasts are great. Another video is great. Another e-course is great. But at the end of the day, the surefire way, that's a Kentucky way for certain. That's what we say there. The surefire way to get anointed is to spend time in the presence of God. To spend time in the presence of God. Because presence also provides revelation of God's timing. 
This is why they could hear for tomorrow. You see, they got a time frame. A lot of times we ask the Lord when. Here's when. Get in the presence and get the answer. God will reveal his timing to you in the presence. The presence deals a death blow to confusion. And instability, right? Um, what is it that Timothy said? For God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of what? A power of love. And what else? A sound mind that gives us the stability in our mind so that we're not back and forth, not tossed to and fro, like Paul said, by every wave of doctrine. How about this? By every wave of culture. We're stable, we're secure in our mind, we're focused, we're lightning focused, and we know the timing of the Lord. We know when we get into the presence, we have confidence and we can step out saying this, wonders are on their way. Wonders are on their way. And that's, that's point seven. The presence of God will always take you into greater things. The presence of God will always take you into greater things. Number seven, I got one more point. Brian, if you want to come up and play, I'm going to finish up with some prayer. So the last, the last part of the scripture here was take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. Now, this is where we don't just sit, but we also work. Listen, as presence people, we are called to be those that behold God in prayer and worship. That is true. But here's something I believe that the enemy has worked very hard to do for a very long time. is to separate the ministry of the prophet and the evangelist. And here's what I mean by that is that the prophetic person, right, the prayer warrior, they're the people, they're in the, they're in the presence, they're in the prayer closet, they're in the secret place, they love to stay there. And what happens is the enemy tries to taunt the evangelist to criticize the prophet and say, if you'd get out of your prayer closet, maybe you'd see some salvations. If you'd stop sitting in the secret place, maybe you'd have some impact. Right? But then what's the prophetic person doing? They're looking over when they're tempted by the enemy and say, if you'd get off the street corner and stop preaching on your soapbox and get back into the prayer closet, maybe you'd be anointed enough to see something happen. Right? The enemy's tried to separate these two ministries and tried to uh, dismantle and segregate the body. But I just believe that what God's doing in this hour is he's marrying the ministries of the prophet and the evangelist to where we are people who truly understand the concept of what my spiritual mom says, Heidi Baker, soak and go. Right? You lay down and you get pickled and you receive from the Lord and you worship, but then you get up and you take the gospel to the lost and to the hurting and to the dying and to the impoverished and to the widow and to the orphan and to the prostitute and to the prisoner. And you go in saturated with that power so that when you go in, you're not going in by your own strength. And if you guys have ever watched any videos from Heidi on YouTube, whenever she worships, she says this, whoa. If you've ever watched her, whoa, that's what she does. And one day she preached a message at my mission school 15 years ago. She said, this was the title of it. You got to whoa before you go. <laughs> I love that. Love that woman. We got to get her back here, you guys. But this is what sets world-changing king, kingdom leaders apart. They are presence people. They're presence carriers. So that when they go into terrible places, they go in with love. Listen, everybody wants a king like Jesus. They may not recognize their need for him yet, but deep down they want him without knowing it's he that they want. That's why one of his names is Jesus, the desire of the nations. Everybody wants Jesus. They just don't know that they, know, that they want him yet. We got to carry him there, loving them, saturated with the presence. And the presence, church, is what makes us attractive. It what's, it's what makes our coworkers look at us, scratch their head, and say, what is different about you? It's the presence. What it, you walk in your college campus and say, what is different about that girl? The presence. Just as we set ourselves apart to spend time with God in his presence, God sets us apart as we spend time in his presence. And it's notable and it's anointing and it's attractive and people flock to it. If Jesus be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto himself, right? And that's what happens. This is our job, church, is to carry the glory of God to the world. And that's the last point. I am purposed, everybody say, I am purposed to carry the presence of God into the world. I am purposed to carry the presence of God into the world. Listen, you don't step into any atmospheres as a thermometer. I know some people that, oh, it's dark in here. 
No, no, you are a thermostat. You are not checking for any atmosphere. You are coming in and you are setting the tone. You are setting the spirit. You are setting the energy. Could I say it like this? You're setting the vibe. Right? I've, I've gone into places, restaurants that I didn't, you know, uh, Thai restaurants and uh, new age places. I didn't even know they were like, and, and they said, man, it just feels good over here around your table. You guys got the good vibes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about that vibe. His name is Jesus. It's true. I've seen it, man. So as a new creation, this is our job description. As we share the presence of God with the world. You know, if it was a, if it was a normal Sunday, you know, we probably already would have closed down a long, at least probably 30 minutes ago. But I think what happened here today among us as friends and family and among uh, you guys online, everybody who's tuning in, dialed in all over the world, thank you for jumping on. It was important and it was purposeful that you were here today because God wants to put in his people a priority for his presence. And that's what I want to pray. If you guys don't mind, just to stand with me for a moment. If you're at home, just put your hand on your heart and just begin to pray alongside us here in the church. Lord, we just pray that you would put a priority in us for the presence, that you'd mess us up for prayer, that you'd wreck us for the word, Lord, that we would just be so devoted to the face of Jesus, not the blessings, not the hands, not everything that God can do for us, but the person and the presence of Jesus, literally proclaiming, God, we want you. Even if you don't give us everything we pray and ask for, God, we get you. Even if I don't get rewarded for something good that I did, I get you. Even if I don't get blessed or I don't get a raise or a promotion or breakthrough, I get you. And I always have a reason to rejoice, no matter how bad it is, because I get you. Lord, make us more aware of your presence. God, even as we commute and ride in the car by ourselves at times, God, make us aware of the presence of Jesus speaking to us, loving us. When we do our devotional time and read your word, make us aware of the presence of Jesus. At random times when we're walking around the grocery store or doing something in our job, make us aware of the presence of Jesus. I just pray, God, over our minds, over our hearts, that you would touch us to pay more attention uh, to you and to hear you more clearly and to see you more clearly. Yeah, could you just ask the Lord for that wherever you are, just at home. We just ask God to help us to pay greater attention. Help us to pause. Help us not to be so distracted. Help us not to be so obsessed with scrolling, uh, uh, you know, on, on social media and stuff that we would literally take a time to say what is God saying today what's God doing today I got fresh bread today I got fresh bread today that's what he said in the Lord's prayer there's fresh bread Lord make us aware of the fresh bread yes God yes God yes God yes God we pray these things in Jesus name Lord we thank you we thank you we thank you we thank you in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name everybody said amen Amen and amen and amen.